I think that the Fed is going to come to the rescue. And usually they come very strongly, at least for the last two recessions. And if you do see they, they coming back with, with money printing even more than we saw in 08 and so forth, I think gold can turn parabolic here. You know, things can get, can change quite a lot in the, in the, next, in the next two years or so. Um, we're, we're talking about 20, 30 percent moving gold, but this this can be a joke rather, you know, if, if we do have um, the type of policies we've had in the past, you know, if, if they do double down and money printing, things can get very extreme here very quickly. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George Round, only available at stbullion.com. Now enjoy this interview. Welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Today I'm excited to have first-time guest, Mr. Octavio Costa. He's a global market analyst at Crestcast Capital. Today he's joined us to share his thoughts on the global economy, the financial markets, as well as a variety of other subject matter. So Octavio, welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, it's, it's a pleasure. Well, I appreciate you uh, sitting down here to share your thoughts. And so for short, I'll call you Tavi, as you mentioned. And so I'm looking forward to getting your perspective on a variety of subject matter, as I mentioned. And so it's interesting to actually speak with someone who studies global events from a, a macro analyst standpoint. So I'm definitely looking forward to getting into some in-depth questions on the developments happening out in the Eastern Hemisphere. But before we get into that, uh, typically start off with one question. And that question is, what comes to mind when Tavi Costa Here's the words, rethink of the dollar. Rethink of the dollar, uh, the, I think the first thing that comes in my mind is, is the excessive leverage in the system globally, um, and especially when you compare that throughout history. It's really an unprecedented level of, of that to GDP. Uh, and rethinking of the dollar makes me think of gold, obviously, and precious metals in general, which have historically proved to be the, you know, the only and real way of, of money itself. And uh, so... Um, and going back to before the 70s and so forth, as we used to have that pegged uh, ratio with the dollar and so forth. And um, so we're thinking of the dollar uh, makes me think about even I was I did a research that is very interesting. I'll go a little bit here, which is uh, regarding uh, the presidential terms in the U.S. since the, the change in the 70s of, uh, of the gold peg and so forth. And actually, you know, it's just looking at real GDP growth versus, uh, um, you know, which term in which electoral, uh, which president term was able to actually produce uh, real GDP growth that was net of, of, of increasing in, in debt in general and in the U.S. And what I found out was that uh, there was only one throughout this whole age. And the point is not to get political at all, but it's, it's a matter of the fact of as we increase um, debt and with being, you know, allowing central banks to really print money and, and, and getting this out of control, we've, we've got to a level that we're not really growing anymore as, as, as we're supposed to as before um, the 70s or so when we used to really create real GDP growth, net of, of creating uh, debt. So I think that's the first thing that comes to my mind. I could probably give you a better answer some other time for think about this, but I think that's my, my best take on that. Fair enough. And so that's one of the things where it's not a right or wrong, it's more so what comes to mind. And I appreciate you sharing that. And you, you, you tied in, you know, the historical aspects and the importance of gold and then debt and GDP. So those are all ways of breaking it down. Now, the goal with this show is to basically reach out to those that are unaware, those that have no true financial literacy, or as I like to say, monetary awareness. And so in your opinion, would you say that the current events that are underway, which we're going to get into, uh, should allow people to really begin thinking outside of their conventional uh, financial frameworks of just doing things in a practical sense, given that so much around us is changing. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, we're, we, we've reached the level of valuations in terms of assets overall in general. And, and it's, uh, you know, it, obviously it's very excessive, especially in the stock market and in public and, and, and private um, um, uh, companies in general and, and real estate and so forth. And when you put that all together, um, I, you know, if, you know and, and you look at the deterioration of, of economic conditions in the U.S., there's certainly a spread of prices being a, a historically overvalued and, and, and there's imbalances of, on, on the macro setup. And, you know, you can see that in so many ways. And obviously, the first thing that comes to my mind is not to take a very um, uh, risky uh, stance in terms of the markets, in terms of uh, how you how you position yourself with your assets. So uh, for, for us and for me, I, I would say, you know, taking a look at, uh, 
um, you know, what are this, you know, the, the so-called safe haven assets? What are the most uh, appropriate ones for, for an environment like this? I think that today precious metals look, you know, very attractive for in so many ways, not just in the long-term thesis, but the short-term uh, thesis as well, especially when you look at that, you know, like precious metals relative to stocks, uh, um, a ratio. Let's just look at gold to S&P 500 ratio, for instance. You know, it's been breaking out from a downward trend. It looks very interesting or, or just a Russell 3000. Russell 3000 is more of like the broad stock market index. And we look at that versus like silver, which is your high beta um, uh, precious metals style, I would say, and that, right, the high beta uh, version of gold. Uh, and when you look at that, it's, it's you know, it, it just retested the levels of insane valuations we had in 2000. It's been now kind of breaking down after retesting that level in a perfect double top kind of uh, set up. So it's, you know, technically looking interesting, uh, fundamentally look interesting, macro wise looks interesting. So on uh, the short and long term, you know, if you look at global fiat, how much money we've printed and so forth uh, uh, of, 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 of global fiat in general, not just the US, like China um, and, you know, and the ECB and, and, you know, when you put that all together, it looks, you know, it looks very interesting also in the long term picture, but the short term picture of gold, uh, given, Given this macro uh, scenario, I think it's uh, it's quite attractive to us to be long precious metals in general. All right, sounds good. Now, as we move forward, I I'm interested in getting your thoughts from a global macro analyst type of perspective. And so I want to throw out the question, we're halfway through the year 2019. And so assuming there are some things or some areas or something out there that you're keeping an eye on that probably concerns you more so uh, than other areas. And so what, 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 what concerns you the most as an analyst? What are you keeping your eye on that could be problematic for those that are maybe not even in the know-how or bring it to our attention right now? All right, I'll, I'll bring it down. I mean, there's a lot to, to talk about, but there's three topics. So obviously, precious metals, I've already presented that I'm very bullish and positive about that because of the safe haven aspect of it. The second one would be the U.S. being at this historic bubble in terms of, uh, of, of valuations of stocks, especially. And the third one would be China being this large credit bubble that would, you know, perhaps the largest one we've seen in, 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 uh, in history. So I'll start with the U.S. On the U.S. part of it, I think that the, what comes in my mind is the credit markets right now uh, showing about 60% of the yield curve in the U.S. is today inverted. And that's a big deal because it's just as much as it was during the, the global financial crisis and the tech bust as well. Um, and that's just showing you, you know, credit markets tend to be kind of uh, the leading indicator for the stock market. It tends to be the bellwether for, for the economy as well and so forth. And you're starting to see some divergences that are quite interesting. Um, you know, first of all, you know, the two-year yields that tend to, uh, you know, that is declining um, on a non-stop since November of 2018. And they're kind of telling you that the credit markets are expecting the Fed will cut rates. And if, when the Fed cut interest rates late in the cycle at record valuations, it's never a good sign. So that's, for me, the credit market is really telling right now. Um, the second part being, you know, copper prices is starting to to uh, to fall apart, and that's kind of a big deal. We saw not recently, but uh, or I should say, not in the last week or so, but the gold to to uh, to oil ratio was spiking. That's a ratio that everyone should be watching for. Um, and you know, this move in gold has been kind of it's real. You know, it's 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 just the beginning, in my opinion, of of upper trend. Um, and there's so many signs there. And then you have China. China, you know, it grew its, uh, its, its credit uh, system in, in a way that we've never seen before. It's a 400% growth in, in banking assets on balance sheet. If you include off balance sheet assets, it's even more. It's like a $45, $40 trillion of off balance sheet assets on top of another $40 trillion of on balance sheet. So it's just, you know, it's just a huge amount of credit in China, uh, which we think it's going to unfold in a way that gold prices in renminbi terms are likely to rise um, as we call this to be, or we call it, there's a, we call the, the macro trade of the century, which is being long gold in, in, in renminbi terms and selling global stocks, mostly U.S. because they're the most overvalued ones. And we can dig into the China thesis. It's very complex, but, uh, or not, I wouldn't say complex, but, you know, you can really go in depth with so many ways of analyzing Australian and Canadian economies that also involved, you know, the distortion of, uh, of their housing prices coming from the issues from China in our view. Um, and it, so that's, you know, that's the first part of, uh, of the imbalances, the macro imbalances. I think those are the, the three themes that we're really paying attention to today. 
Right. Now, out of the three things you just described, you know, two things really stood out. <clears throat> we have the U.S., the credit cycle here, and the issues we're having, give it that. And then we have the debt cycle out in China, where you mentioned 40 trillion off balance, 40 trillion on balance. <clears throat> and so all of that right now is in the midst of this trade war. And so not quite sure how this will pan out, but I imagine it won't be comfortable because both nations are dependent upon each other, one as a creditor, one as a debtor. And so what are your thoughts on that? And how does this play into the, the, the global picture? What, what, how will this play out, basically? <laughs> sure. We've been in this kind of virtuous cycle of the trade war, right? At first, we have this kind of like uh, the administration, Trump administration gets kind of hawkish on China. And then we have the market selling off significantly on the kind of like trade war fears. And then things kind of change with the administration kind of hinting at resolution and the market kind of rallies on that temporary news. And then, and then we come out with kind of a, uh, you know, the resolution really is that there is no progress being made and, and the market kind of, and then the administration turns hawkish again, the market sell off. And then we're now in this, in, in kind of the market rallying uh, temporary on the news right now, which is uh, that, that we might get a, a deal here in the G20 meeting in, in Japan. And that's, you know, for us, that's, that's not, you know, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to see a significant deal between China and the U.S. And China, uh, if you think about the Chinese economy and how their model, economic model, has worked throughout history, right, at least for the last decade or so, it's very uh, relied, it relies a lot on, on the, their current account. Their current account has been shrinking significantly. We put out this chart looking at the current account in China. So, it, it, you know, you can see the, the current account change of, of multiple countries from the global financial crisis to today and, and how that affects the currency valuation of those countries. And what you see is that China is the only country in the world that its current account actually uh, um, shrinks significantly for over nine percentage points. At the same time, their currency actually appreciated versus the dollar. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, something has to give. And if China is going to lose their, uh, their export-led economy uh, model uh, in the following years, I think that that's, uh, that's going to cost them uh, the, the currency depreciation here in the following years, especially given how much credit they have in their economy in general. And if you think about the trade war, the only thing that would really come out either is a trade war, which is negative for both country, countries, especially China, but the second part of it would be, well, let's say we do have a deal, then the U.S. would be either exporting more to China or China would be exporting less to the U.S. And both cases would actually cause the current account of China to, to uh, shrink even further, which, you know, just, just uh, makes this case even bigger in terms of uh, expecting the Chinese uh, um, to devalue its currency. So that's my take on, on, on the trade war, which I think it's going to be key now as we switch, if we are really in this cycle as we have been for, uh, you know, for the last year or so of, of trade wars, I think we're going to about, you know, we're about that cycle where we go through, uh, we realize that there's no real um, uh, commitment made between the two countries. And then the, the Trump administration becomes more hawkish. And then we kind of see that sell off again coming in. I think that right now it's, it's, it's looking at a very, uh, right at the pinnacle point of this whole um, uh, of this whole trade deal situation. Right. Now, factoring in a trade deal that's underway, as a result of that, it usually shows up in the currency, <clears throat> in the currency market, in the currency uh, section itself. And so outside of the trade war, uh, the whole devaluation of currencies, I, I remember President Trump, you know, throwing out words such as currency manipulators and things of that nature. And so ultimately, I believe that everyone's trying to get that upper edge over each other from a trading standpoint. And so the, the remember the dollar long term, you know, where do you see those two, you know, what, what's an ideal trading valuation for those currencies, give or take the trade war outside of that or, or however it may play out? That's a good question because I do have a very strong view on gold and precious metals in general. But I also think that between among all the the dirty uh, shirts of, uh, of currencies out there, I think the dollar is the cleanest. But and I think that the dollar is likely to appreciate versus the, the, the yuan or the renminbi. Um, and, and the reason for that, obviously, I kind of laid it out already, but if there is a spread of, uh, if you look at the divergence, how do, you, how do you calculate the divergence of monetary policies between the PBOC, the Chinese Central Bank, and the U.S. or the Fed? Uh, one way is to look at the Shibor 
um, um, Schreiber rate, overnight rate versus the Fed funds rate spread. And when you look at that spread, you know, it tends to follow the USDCNY or the Chinese uh, uh, currency very closely, and which kind of uh, uh, it suggests you that, that the Chinese currency should be trading or the USDCNY should be trading above seven already, the seven rate. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's fair to say that um, um, the value of, of the Chinese currency should be at least 20 to 30 percent um, uh, the, the value or depreciated, in other words, should be somewhere uh, well above the seven, the seven rate right now, and uh, um, and that's you know that's given my take, and it, it's kind of interesting because uh, uh, the, the the Trump administration obviously uh, has a, I would say a different view. If you look, read books of like Peter Navarro, the guy from you know one of the main guys and. In this uh, negotiation, aside from uh, uh, Lighthizer and so and some others, but um, you know, if you read his book, he has a whole chapter kind of dedicated on that. But talking about not the, the currency being, but, but as they being the manipulators of the currency. So you know, I, we think it's kind of interesting that that uh, um, you know how we see China is is much more. It's 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 too much debt that it leads to. I mean, if you look at history of, of emerging markets and how when they have credit busts, they usually you know, usually you see uh, 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 the, their their currency devaluing, but at the same time you see gold in local currency terms to rising. Now, that's kind of the development that we've seen throughout history. Um, now I think that that whole uh, trade war is what's causing right now. It's it's really almost like a currency war, which is. Nothing short of, of positive for gold. I mean, this is all great for gold. So uh, uh, our firm is is really very bullish on, on precious metals, especially now and and given all this. We, we use the word gold a lot, and so there's other people I'm sure watching this. What about silver? He hasn't said much about silver, and so we have you know just fourteen hundred dollars ounce gold, fifteen out of silver, one ratio one ninety four to one or whatever it might be. You know, what are your thoughts on silver, and is that also a strategic metal that can definitely uh, benefit people in the long run as well? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, I, silver is a high beta version of gold, and it's. For us, it's 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 so cheap right now. I mean, it's in our view. If you look at things like right now, precious metals had a, it's a significant move in the short term. But if you look at uh, silver, for instance, implied volatility for the last for for a year for the next year on at the money options, and you can see that all the way back to two thousand or so, it's actually at one of the lowest time uh, levels in history. Uh, in which you know, given this move already, and it's it hasn't really moved at all. It, I think that uh, if you're bullish in gold, obviously uh, uh, we are, and we think silver is is just the same situation. That research I did with Russell 3000 was against silver. It wasn't really versus gold, it was versus silver because, you know, we're looking also in a more of a broad sense of what, what you know, of, of the stock market. And there's a lot of small cap companies too. So it's more of like a high beta version of the S&P 500. And to be comparable, you wanted to look at something more of a high beta version of gold, and that would be silver. Um, mining stocks look very interesting too. Um, we we have a basket of of, of mining stocks, gold and, uh, and silver mining stocks in our portfolio that we think that there is going to be a lot of uh, of uh, we think there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the industry of of companies buying each other uh, assets, and and we're looking at the best companies that have that that have the most valuable um, assets with. Uh, with hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to generate free cash flow in the following years if precious metals work the way we think it will work, and which is the case. Right. Now, we are approaching our time frame now where all the mainstream news syndicates are talking about economic slowdown or they're using the word recession. And so according to a lot of indicators, you know, you mentioned, start off earlier talking about the yield curve. There's a lot of indicators that have already flashed red, quote unquote, and so we are either in or approaching a slowdown. And so what does this next economic slowdown look like? Is it just as, you know, just, will it look like the past one 10 years ago or will it be worse? Or, or what are your thoughts from a global standpoint? Look, I, I don't, you know, it's hard to pinpoint if it's going to be worse. But in my opinion, it's just going to be as bad in terms of the last two recessions as far as stock prices goes because of the valuations that we, we reached in this business cycle. Um, I think that uh, it's fair to say that, you know, today about if you looked at S&P 500, for instance, about there's like eight factors that we see, uh, fundamental factors that, that stocks look, you know, historically overvalued, if not at all time highs. Um, and, you know, if we're going to go back to median prices or so forth, I think that 
it's it's fair to say that from the peak we're, we should expect somewhere close to a 40 percent decline in stock prices but as we know throughout history the stock prices or any asset class when when it when it declines it doesn't go back to the medium or the average it usually surpasses that and then comes back and that's when the time when it gets cheap so you know it's likely that we might see even a 50 percent drawdown in stocks and so forth i think there's a high probability of that I think that it's likely to happen in a one to two year horizon here. I, I think that one of the best uh, investments one could find is, and I, when I say gold, I mean, you could apply that with silver mining stocks too. But one that I'd like to say that is uh, uh, one of my high conviction trades is, is just owning gold, uh, the gold to S&P 500 ratio. I think that ratio has, you know, uh, it's, it's in the very early stages of moving on the upward trend. And it's going to be, you know, right now it's at 0.4, I think. It, it's likely to go close to one at least if there is if this whole thesis really materializes itself. I think that you know, and we do see a recession. We're already seeing some some pretty interesting signs. Like I think sixty percent of of countries in the globe today are with PMIs below fifty today. That's recessionary already. You know, and it's you know we're seeing some other Empire State number came out pretty bad here recently on a month over month basis. It was a pretty big decline. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, consumer confidence now take lower, which is something that tends to reach a peak right at the peak of a cycle as well. Um, there's so many, you know, unemployment rate is, you know, if you look at a year over year change of unemployment rate, it's starting to look interesting when it starts to rise. Uh, it's, it's, it's the moment when you start, you know, selling stocks. So we're looking at a, a range of, of, of macro signals that are really showing us that we're, uh, if we're not, you know, we're getting really close to this recessionary uh, a period that, that I think stocks look, you know, really overvalued and there's no point to own stocks right now in my view, but unless it's uh, mining, um, the mining sector of uh, gold and silver mining stocks, but. All right now, so you say you, there's no real point in your in your opinion of holding uh, stocks, and so a good portion of the viewers of this program here are those that follow the conventional pathway, and so they pretty much dedicate they they've allowed their financial futures to be for the most part automated in your typical mutual funds and the the the, the pensions, four hundred one ks, IRAs, the average working class financial vehicle that people use, and so for those that are watching and listening, like they're, they're probably thinking this gentleman here is saying sell stocks. But yet, you know, I'm invested in that out of my paycheck. And so I don't really have much say so. Or, or what would you say to that person that has a program set up for them and they just contribute out of, out of their paycheck every two weeks or so? As far as contrib contributing your money to a retirement plan, I'm in the same boat. And I am, you know, I have all my money on, on pretty much on gold and, and precious metals in general. Um, I'm out of the, the stock market. I, you know, for my retirement account, for instance, I'm just giving you my case. I, I'm not shorting stocks. And I have some of my money that is being short. That is my uh, whatever money I'm, I'm saving that I put on on more of a speculative type of uh, strategy. But the money that I want to look on the on the future and I want to save it and, and let it grow. I, I'm on precious metals mostly today, um, and you know I'm. Um, I have some cash as well. And, you know, it's just a uh, allocation today. There's so many ways you can protect your portfolio. Precious metals is one main one. Um, and, and there are other ones too. Uh, but, um, you know, those are the ones I favor uh, today. But, uh, you know, you can even look at, like, for instance, treasuries. Treasuries have worked well right now. And there's a great case for why treasuries could sell off in the future because of the amount of leverage we have in the U.S. and so forth. Uh, and I kind of understand that view, and I probably agree with it too. I mean, I, it's hard to disagree. Um, but if you look at interest rates versus uh, other interest rates globally, like let's say the German bonds, um, you know, being in negative rates, you would think that there's there should be some convergence of uh, of the two rates of U.S. versus Germany. And if and that tends to happen as as you kind of get to this late stages of, of the business cycle, which we had a chart on this, and it's very interesting how, let's say, five-year yield spread between U.S. and Germany tends to converge as, as you get to, uh, the, as, as the market or the crisis begin to unfold. Um, and, you know, I think that's another way, but it's more sophisticated. Some people don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, we, we do that in our portfolio. And uh, so, you know, if, if you were invested in stocks, I think there has never been a better time for you to, to uh to, to, to profit, in my opinion, uh, from, from what you made uh, this year and, 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 you know, and, and, and just either stay on cash or invest in precious metals or, or have an allocation that is uh, a proper, uh, you know, in, in, in different buckets there. And that's, I think it's the best way.
Right. Fair enough. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, where currently, as you mentioned, the business cycle a couple of times. So it looks like Jerome Powell, FOMC, the Federal Reserve, they keep commenting on wanting to keep this expansion going as long as they can, assuming that they're aware of the fact that once it ends, there might be some really serious uh, consequences to their own policies. And so they throw out the word monetary toolkit. And so I keep I pay attention closely to what they say and they keep mentioning about the tools they have. And they're going to utilize what they've done before, more easy stimulus, quantitative, four guys, whatever. And then also they mentioned about some possibilities of a new tools. So what are your thoughts on whether it be a rate height, uh, rate cut rather this year? How far, how low can it go? How will that impact other central banks? Or do we all begin cutting or, or what are some scenarios that you probably consider or think about? It's interesting because uh, I think policies have got more extreme uh, throughout history, especially now. I mean, uh, given where we are and having, you know, close uh, there to 2% or 2.5% interest rates, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of insane. But, um, you know, and I think that uh, given that, I'm, I, I do expect a lot of, uh, you know, uh, further QE, you know, so reversing the path of, of tightening cycle that we are right now, not just on rates, but also on, uh, on reducing or depleting uh, assets from the Federal Reserve balance sheet, uh, which has been, it's almost, it's, it was close to like uh, to $1 trillion of, of depletion already, which is kind of significant. I think that that can reverse very quickly if there is a turmoil in the markets. Uh, interest rate wise, I think that, uh, um, you know, I don't have a, a, a target for where rates should be right now, but uh, because we're not really shorting the two year yields or any short duration, I'm sorry, shorting yields, yeah. Um, and we're not doing anything like that right now. We're long treasuries in the 10 years, but, so it's a little bit different. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, that, that at least two, two uh, uh, rate cuts is, uh, are likely to happen in, in, in 2019. And, um, and then after that, I think that uh, <laughs> we can go back to zero very quickly. I mean, it very, very quickly. Uh, and then if that happens, I think that uh, precious metals will be in a very interesting position. Uh, I think people are just kind of warming up to that right now. This first move is just, in my opinion, the very early stages of a much bigger move. And, you know, if, if we start to see the, the wheels come off, and especially in the markets in general, I think that the Fed is going to come to the rescue. And usually they come very strongly, at least for the last two recessions. And if you do see they, they coming back with, with money printing even more than we saw in 08 and so forth, I think gold can turn parabolic here. You know, things can get can change quite a lot in the, the, next, in the next two years or so. Um, we're, we're talking about 20, 30 percent moving gold, but this this can be a joke. Rather, you know, if, if we do have um, the type of policies we've had in the past, you know, if, if they do double down and money printing, things can get very extreme here very quickly. Yeah. Now, as we draw towards the end of our chat this afternoon, I want to get your thoughts on, on two subject matters. One is the activity out east with the One Belt, One Road initiative and all the developments of that, because I am a firm believer that that's uh, being set up for life beyond or life after the Federal Reserve note being the reserve currency. Do you think the Federal Reserve currency still has a nice lengthy lifespan to it? And if it does or doesn't, how does that One Belt, One Road initiative play into it, given the fact that they may not be using dollars uh, amongst that whole country situation over there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, this whole developments in Asia are important to, uh, to be aware of. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I happen to have a very bearish view in China just because of the credit imbalances. But, you know, this move in general away from the dollar seems to be kind of like the, the de-dollarization has been kind of a, a new trend. And, you know, I personally, I don't believe that, the, the remembi is is the answer for it. I don't think it will be, uh, especially uh, given the imbalances that we see and 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 I, the way things are likely to unfold are going to be probably the other way. Uh, somebody made a comment that I totally agree. It's easier for you to see somebody buying oil today in Saudi Riyadh than than actually buying in remembi terms, and I totally agree with that. <laughs> I think that uh, no one really wants to hold remembi um, in the long term here. Um, but you know, I you know, so I. I as far as the existence of the of the fad uh, you know i obviously um in 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 the, in the i wouldn't say obviously but i'm on the, on the fence of uh, or not on the fence i'm on the on the on the camp of 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 person who doesn't believe that 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 really works um and i i think that we shouldn't have something like that but uh 
I don't know if we're close to it at all. I mean, it's it's kind of like this whole move in cryptocurrencies is kind of interesting to me just because, uh, not just because of the value of cryptocurrencies, but the mentality of people uh, really trying to avoid central banks and, and going against it uh, is, is quite interesting. It's the same mentality of the gold bug mentality. And I, you know, they... They, they really they really converge and if you think about it and, and yeah there are two different asset classes but they're you know the, the idea of, of avoiding central banks is is very similar and I I like that people are starting to heating up to, to that kind of uh, um, that kind of concept and uh, I think that more and more we're gonna see that and I think uh, are we gonna go back to uh, gold prices being you know the dollar being packed to gold and so forth I don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon and I uh, I'm not seeing any signs of that today, but um, you know, as far as market goes, I, I do think that um, you know, it, precious metals in general look very attractive. And I think that's the the bottom line of of the research for sure. Right. Now, very good. Now, as we draw towards the end, very last question. You mentioned cryptocurrency. That's what I was going to hit on. So, Bitcoin is having somewhat of a rally now, and so a lot of people. Uh, the channel is more mixed towards precious metals, but yet we have some viewers that are interested in from a speculative standpoint of cryptocurrencies. Now, would you say that in the days ahead, this next rally will surpass the prior high of 2017? And, you know, what's, how high could it go? I mean, would gold, would gold and Bitcoin be equivalent to the same new highs because of all the events that's happening around us uh, or, or what, in your opinion? Look, I have a very um, tough, um, I, 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 I struggle trying to value Bitcoin. I think the technology serves a purpose and it's very important. At the beginning, I didn't think so as much. And today I do see how if you leave in Venezuela and China and trying to get your money out, those places, North Korea, and you're trying to get your money out, Bitcoin became sort of the vehicle, not just Bitcoin, but blockchain itself. Bitcoin became the vehicle because it's kind of like first move advantage and people start using it more and more. Now, as far as you know, finding the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, I myself don't understand too much of it as far as the technology and the algorithm to uh, you know even even in mining Bitcoin and so forth. I don't really understand that, and I I, I don't feel it's weird, but it's one of my principles is to not really um, uh, that to not really buy something I don't understand. I can see Bitcoin certainly moving. Um, as high as you said, above above the the levels of 2017 and so forth. Especially if if that concept that I was alluding to of of people uh, uh, the disbelief of central banks, you know, really continues. I think that's possible. But I think the jury's still out of of in terms of this Bitcoin move being a speculative uh, sort of uh, move, or rather a a. a um, a, a, a fight, a flight to, to safety. Um, I, don't, I don't know yet. I don't have a, v, a strong view on that yet. Um, and, and I'm trying to figure that out, to be quite honest, because I think that's key for what's happening in the markets. If it is a speculative move, you would expect equity markets to follow higher a little bit. Uh, and, you know, obviously I have a different view from that and I need to understand the opposite side of it. And that's, I think that's a, a big part of the other argument that I'm, uh, that I'm still uh, struggling to understand. So I hope I don't, uh, 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 you know, have issues with your viewers, but I have, I have, uh, I, I do struggle um, valuing, and I would love to understand more about the techno. I, I think that uh, um, you know the whole part of blockchain is obviously very interesting, and uh, we're not investing in anything like that yet. But I do find it interesting, and the, the fact that there's more institutions willing to buy cryptocurrencies sounds interesting too. Uh, and I do think it serves a purpose, and I think that's the key. It serves a purpose. Is in the beginning. I thought that this upward move on Bitcoin was initially caused, uh, sure, after that, it became more of a, you know, people that really believe in the technology, on the currency, and so forth. But I think that the beginning of it really came from serving that purpose of, of outflows from places like Venezuela, Argentina, um, even Brazil, and, 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 you know, China, and so forth, uh, which are countries that, unfortunately, if you're a citizen of China and you're trying to get money out of China, you can't really get money out of China in a big way. You can only get money out in a very small portion and it you know venezuela is the same issue so i think that uh you know i think that always is uh it, it paints a picture very well but i don't i don't have a strong view on bitcoin and uh i you know personally i don't i don't own bitcoin and uh, uh i do have a view on, on gold <laughs> fair enough fair enough well octavia costa appreciate you sitting down with us here on rethinking a dollar uh, any last thoughts and can you let the audience know of those who may not know how to find you or 
anything of that nature. Tell them where they can find you at and how to get connected and follow your work. Absolutely. So I'm very, uh, um, I guess, active on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Tavi Costa, T-A-V-I-C-O-S-T-A. Uh, and also I'm, I've been kind of uh, starting my, uh, kind of like yourself, starting my YouTube channel. You've been there for a while, but I'm starting my own just to, uh, to kind of uh, share my ideas. And uh, I usually do kind of a macro outlook and, and go through some of the main charts that I've, uh, I've, created or found somewhere else. And I, you know, I try to kind of uh, paint my narrative as, as uh, on a video. And uh, um, so if you're interested in the type of topic that we're talking about, I think that's a, a good way to find just top Tavi Costa on, on YouTube, you'll find me. Uh, but yeah, and then, um, but um, I'm, I'm, I was glad to be here. And thank you very much for having me.